last installment in our series, Our God is Able. And we're going to look particularly at the reading we've just read, particularly verses 24 and 25, the last two verses of the epistle of Jude. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless. I'm going to read that again. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To God our Saviour, who alone is wise, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power, both now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let's just have a brief word of prayer before we come to consider what lies before us this evening. Lord, as we come to your precious word, we thank you that your word is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. We thank you, Lord, that it's your word that speaks to the heart. And so, Lord, I pray by the power of the Holy Spirit, this night, you will speak right into hearts. You will convict of sin. And that, Lord, tonight, people would find the Lord Jesus as Saviour and Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. As I say, this is our last instalment on the series, Our God is Able. There are a number of verses we haven't considered and will not consider that speak of God's ability. For instance, in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 10 and verse 28, speaking concerning the ability and the authority of the Lord to administer judicial punishment. Because it says, fear not him which can kill the body, but is not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body. In another verse, in the book of Romans, and verse chapter 11, and verse 23, it speaks there, um, they also, if they do not continue in unbelief, will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. A verse speaking, actually, of um, Israel initially, but how we can be grafted into Christ as the people of God, and how God is able to do that. When we started this series, we started by looking at a different text from Psalm 62, verse 11, because we saw that power belongs to the Lord. And we find that that verse can give the Christians such great encouragement in the light of our weakness. And then we found in week two a God who is able to keep his promises. Promise keeper. Romans 4 verse 21. And then we found that he's an aid worker. Hebrews 2.18. He is able to aid those who are being tempted. And then we found that he's a soul keeper. From 2 Timothy 1 verse 12. He is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. And then we found out he was a soul saver. Hebrews 7 verse 25. He is able to save to the uttermost all those who come to God through him. And then we found that he's able to do above and beyond. Because from Ephesians 3, 20 and 21 we found that he's able to do far above all that we can ask or think. 
And then last week, we, oh, and then we found out also he's able to subdue Philippians 3, verse 20 and 21. And he's able to subdue all things unto himself. And especially in the context of Philippians 3, 20 and 21, where he's able to transform our bodies and fashion them to be made like unto his glorious body. And then last week, we read those from, from 2 Corinthians 9, the chapter on giving, and how God is able to make all grace abound to us. You know, not just the fountain of grace that he gets to us to save our souls, but even in our practical giving unto the Lord, He's able to make all grace to abound towards us, to supply our every need, and he's able to perform so many wonderful things for us. Well, tonight, he's able to keep you from stumbling, but he's able to present you faultless. I think this is a wonderful verse. You know, he's able to keep us from falling Hallelujah. He's a wonderful Lord that we come to. And it says here, he's able to keep you from stumbling. He's able to keep you from falling, in other words. To present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. You know, Jude lived in a time when... Christianity was under severe attack. If you don't know who this man Jude was, well, the Hebrew name for him is rendered Judah. The Greek translation of that name is Judas. But he went really under the name of Jude. I guess I didn't want to be called Judas, and you can imagine why. But he was one of, it's generally accepted, that he was one of the four half-brothers of the Lord Jesus Christ. You remember, Mary conceived Christ, and then later, her and Joseph, who wasn't the father of Christ, because our Heavenly Father, hallelujah, um, she had a virgin birth, but, but Mary and Joseph went on to have other children. And so it's generally accepted that he was one of those four half-brothers of the Lord Jesus Christ. But he lived in a time when Christianity was under very severe attack. Political attack from Rome. Aggressive spiritual infiltration from Gnostic-like apostates. And the libertines who sowed abundant seeds of great doctrinal error. And it's quite interesting because he speaks really of these in verse 11. Woe to them, for they have gone in the way of Cain, have run greedily in the error of Balaam for profit, and perished in the rebellion of Korah. And he talks about the apostate. Because you see, an apostate is one who rejects the book. One who rejects the word of God. One who rejects the blood of Christ that was shed for us on the cross. And one who rejects the Lordship of Christ and the fact that he is the only saviour of the lost. And you know, there was all sorts of evil practices. You can read of them earlier in the epistle of Jude, should you read through it. And it's only one chapter. And all these false teachers had infiltrated the church. And Jude had to encourage the Christians to contend for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. 
And this is what he does as he comes to the end of the book. And he says in verse 20, But you, beloved, building yourselves up in the most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. But then he comes to this verse. Verse 24, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the throne of his grace with exceeding joy and goes on to verse 20 down. So firstly tonight, I want you to notice the preservation of the people of God. You know, now to him who is able to keep you from falling. You know, it's a wonderful shift in the letter. Because really, if you like, it's a real doxology towards the end. Because Jude reminds us of the divine power of God. The divine power of God that is able to keep us in a world where we have to contend with heretics. In a world where we have to contend, just like they were for Jews readers in those days, the great perils that are being exposed even in the church of Jesus Christ today. And it's the Lord and the Lord alone who can keep his people. Although we know that um, it is only uh, we observe the apostasy of the heretics. But friends, God is able to keep his own. Aren't you glad tonight that your salvation, if you know the Lord Jesus Christ, is intact? Hallelujah. And we have this blessed truth of the internal security of the saints. And you know, we've been considering this series. We've already said he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Hallelujah. And praise God. You know, in the New Testament, there's much written about our security as the people of God. And, you know, they were moved to write much about this. Because, friends, um, it's, it would be great comfort to us in our day and generation for us as saints of God. You see, friends, there are times when the devil sows doubts in our minds. And sometimes you can doubt even your own salvation. But you know, sometimes I'm sure there's every child of God almost has gone through a time, or not everybody, but most ch children of God have gone through times when they've looked at some of the mistakes they've made and, and they, they've looked at themselves and they've doubted, you know, whether the Lord still loves them or will is keeping them. And you know, the adversary, the devil, he absolutely loves that. He loves that because he wants you to think that you're not saved. He wants you to think that the Lord can't forgive you. But thank God tonight, he's able to keep us from stumbling. He's able to keep us from falling. God's power keeping us. Even in times when we think, you know, we're falling in the darkest traps. You know, friends, I think it's absolutely wonderful that we're being called, we've been sanctified, and God gives us the grace to persecute, persevere, sorry, right to the end. Because this is who Jude wrote to. He said, Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus 
Christ. Isn't it wonderful to be preserved in the Lord Jesus Christ? And here we have it again, now to him who is able to keep you from falling. You know, friends, I think in the New Testament of the soldier that would have been chained to the Apostle Paul. Because um, if he's able to keep you from falling, it means God's watching over you. And that was a mention of a soldier, a, a, a military guard or a sentinel used in the New Testament. And he'd been chained the apostle to watch over him. Think of Luke chapter 2. The shepherds were out in the fields keeping watch over their flock by night. Keeping watch over their flock from the savage animals which would seek to kill the helpless sheep. And you know, friends, there's a verse in 2 Peter chapter 5, 2 Peter Sorry, 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5. And it says, it's speaking, you know, God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment and did not save the ancient world, but save Noah. One of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemning them to destruction, making them an example to those who would live ungodly. But that, you see, friends, God is watching over his people as a mighty captain he keeps us from the enemy who would seek to destroy us as the good shepherd of the sheep he keeps us from the ravening wolves the apostate teachers that would seek to destroy us and he keeps us from the deluge of god's wrath you know what he did in noah's day Friends, he's going to do again with people. He's going to condemn them to hell. But friends, let me tell you, the, the deluge of God's wrath would destroy every one of us. But when we know him as Lord and Savior, his eye is upon us. And if you have any doubts about the ability of God to keep you, think of that wonderful Psalm 121. Oh, I lift my eyes to the hills. From whence cometh my help? My help cometh from the Lord. And the psalm goes on to tell you he's able to keep you. You see, friends, anybody, even Christians, can be carried away by false teaching. Errors of doctrine even temptation of sin. But friends, God is able to keep you from such falls. You know, friends, very often it's not that God isn't able to keep us. Very often it's our own powerlessness and our own failure that stops us from keeping ourselves in the love of Christ. But friends, here in Jude, he's warning us about secret sin. And friends, he can keep us in all these times. And friends, he provides a way of escape when temptation comes. And thereby we grow for the next time that it comes along. And hallelujah. Well, the second thing tonight we notice, is not just the preservation of the saints, but the presentation of the saints. Because verse 24 goes on to say, 
and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Now here we have a contrast to stumbling and falling because the word present means to stand. And in the context, to stand before the presence of him, almighty God. The psalmist asked the question, didn't he? Oh Lord, if you should mark our iniquities, who could stand? You know, Adam could not stand in the presence of the Lord after sin entered because he was driven out from the presence of the Lord in the garden. And friends, you and I tonight, our sin has separated us from God and shut us out from the presence of God and certainly shut us out from that privilege of standing before him except through the Lord Jesus Christ. You see the Bible says in Revelation 6 verse 17, for the great day of his wrath has come and who is able to stand? But you see, friends, Jude tells us that those who are preserved by the Lord, those who belong to Jesus, they are going to be presented Amen. faultless Lord. and able to stand. Those who are united to Christ, those who are living in Christ, those who are abiding in Christ, the vine are the ones who he keeps from falling. You see, friends, none of us have any stability of ourselves. It's only the grace of God and the imputed righteousness of Jesus and the blood of the Lord Jesus that enables to stand. But friends, he will present us faultless before him. You know, that word faultless means absolutely blameless and unblameable. <laughs> you know, Colossians chapter 1 and verse 21. And you who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, Yet now has he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy, blameless, and above reproach in his sight, if indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you have heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, which I, Paul, he said, became a minister. Unblameable. You know, friends, it's a wonderful thing. You know, in the Greek, this word blameless, it means not only acquittal, but it means the absence of a charge or an accusation. And you know, friends, that's how Christ is able to present you. What did Paul the Apostle say in the book of Romans and in chapter 8? He said these words. Romans chapter 8, verse 33. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also give us all things? 
Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. That's why we can be presented blameless and faultless. Let me just take another verse on that theme from 1 Thessalonians 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 23. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit, soul and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise his lovely name. You know, friends, this is, this is how you and I will stand in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because Christ as a lamb presented himself without spot and wrinkle to God as a sacrifice on our behalf. And therefore Christ is able to present a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. Thirdly and finally, so we talked about the preservation of the saints. We've talked about the presentation of the saints, but the proclamation of the saints. Because it says in our text tonight, now, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to God our Saviour, who alone is wise, be glory, majesty, dominion and power both now and forever. Amen. It's a verbal expression of adoration. Directed to our God, who is worthy of all glory, dominion and power. You see, remember, Jude, throughout the epistle, has been thundering out about the apostasy of the day. But you know, he does not close the book without blessing God for preserving the saints from falling. For presenting them faultless in the presence of his glory. And now the saints proclaiming him. Now what does he mean when he says to God our Saviour who alone is wise be glory, majesty, dominion and power. What does he mean by that? I mean after all can we add anything? To the excellency that God already has? Can we add anything to his majesty and his dominion and his power? Can we add to that? No, we can't. He's already majestic. He's already full of power. He's already full of dominion. All those things are eternally and unchangeably facts about our God. He possesses all these things in himself. It's not that he receives them from us, but they can be proclaimed by us because we see in him the glory the majesty, the dominion, and the power that belongs already to him. Why? Because he is worthy. How do I know that? Well, Revelation 5 verse 12. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain 
to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor, glory and blessing. Friends, we are, we are proclaiming what he already has. And folks, the wonderful thing is, we can give him that glory because he is worthy. Tonight, brothers and sisters, our God is able. Our God is able. But he's waiting of you submitting to him and saying, God, what you are able to do, do it in me. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the encouragement of your word. We pray, Lord God, as your people, that you will help us, that, Lord God, we may take these promises of Scripture to our hearts, and that, Lord, they would encourage us on our journey in our Christian faith. And, Lord, we look forward to that day when you will present us faultless before the Lamb. In Jesus' name. Amen.